Hello out there and welcome to the No Shit Cast. I'm your host, Matt Frazier. Tonight's guest, the legendary Jim Ward on deck to talk to us. My co-host for this evening and co-pilot for the festivities is the dark wizard himself of knowledge, Mr. Eric D. Smith. Hello. So, um, some interesting stuff going on with the show these days, folks. Uh, We've been working with uh, the X-Factory Creative Network, uh, Tangent over there. Um, he's been uh, designing and setting up our web page that's supposed to go live around March 1st. Um, amazing work over there by Tangent. Um, and if you guys don't um, know who this guy is, um, we we struck this deal, I guess, about three months ago where we started working with him pretty much in hand in hand. So he's kind of like our fifth beetle at this point. Um, he's definitely an integral part of our team, does all of our promotion and, and uh, handles almost all of our web and, and uh, social media activity now. Um, but, uh, so if you, if you reach out to us, uh, for an interview or if you want to set something up, um, and you get a response from a guy named Tangent, uh, he's on our team (laughs) and feel free to talk to him, um, about that. So, uh, as part of, I guess, uh, our launch as well, um, for those of you that have been asking for downloadable media, um, part uh, right soon after we launch the website, we're also going to be moving all of the podcasts up onto iTunes so that people can download them into their uh, personal devices and um, I guess the request so people can listen to it in their cars on the way to work and stuff like that. Mowing the grass or jogging <laughs> or any of that. So I'm going to jump straight into this. Um, I'm just going to read off this page here. This um, uh, The first science fiction RPG, um, the Lost 77 World Science Fiction Apocalyptic RPG, Gamma World, uh, deities and demigods that's that's dungeons and dragons yep uh greyhawk adventures it just goes on and on voted into the game designer hall of fame and our guest for this evening's festivities mr jim ward thank you sir for being on the show how you doing this evening for asking so hey i wanted to tell you before um we get started that ken saint andre asked me to say hello to you he said that he met you at a uh West Texas convention and talk to you for a little bit. So I told him I would oh, do sure, something. That's very nice of him. <laughs> so, Jim, I was wondering, um, how, when, what was some of the ways that you got into playing board games when you were younger? Like, how did you get involved in, in gaming? Well, that's a great question. Um, actually, um, I, when I was younger, in my early, early age and teens, my dad taught me how to play poker, but that was about the only game I ever played. <laughs> it wasn't until I met Gary Gygax in 1974 that I really started playing board games and role-playing games. Did you start playing war war games with Gary? Yes, he taught me and beat me. It was really good. He was always looking for competitors. And he designed a game called Alexander the Great and a game called Dunkirk. And he was more than happy to teach people how to play it so that he could crush them like bugs. <laughs> I have heard some stories of, and stuff. I, I, um, I have played Alexander, but I've not played Dunkirk. Um, so, <laughs> One of the red-letter days of my career was when I beat Gary in Chinese checkers. <laughs> Did you get any kind of special trophy for that? No, I should have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just bragging rights. I played many a game of Chinese checkers with him. He beat me every time but once. Wow. Yeah, I mean, the bragging rights alone was enough, right? <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely. I have, that with, I have that with my wife. Uh, she kills me at Scrabble, and I beat her one time, and I've never played with her since. Now I can say <laughs> Well, there you go. <laughs> well, we all have wife stories like that. Oh, my. Yes. I, I won't tell any of mine, though, but <laughs> after you, you know, you so you said that you played um, poker mostly until you met up with Gary, and then you started playing various other types of games, right? Yes, absolutely. How old were you when that happened? I met Gary in my early 20s. Was you already out and working in the workforce at that point? Yeah, I was a teacher. It was 1974, and I was a... Uh, uh, substitute teacher and then i went to being a 
high school teacher. I worked as a teacher for 74 to 80. And I always told Gary every single year that anytime you could afford my teacher's salary, that I would come work for him. Ah. And in, in 1980, he decided he could afford the $9,200 I was getting a year as a teacher. <laughs> Wow, that's cool. That's cool. So you basically just imported over into the business of game design then, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Interesting. Cool. And from that point, a lot of people know a lot of what you've done. I know that you designed the first science fiction role-playing game, Metamorphosis Alpha. Um, that led to Gamma World and uh, many other things through TSR, like the Deities and Demigods book and Greyhawk Adventures and all of that. Um, and then a lot of people know about that point in your career, but at the end of that point of your career, uh, did you continue to devise games for various companies up until this present point? Absolutely. I left, I left those guys in 97, left TSR, when it moved over to uh, the coast and Wizards of the Coast. And, uh, and I started doing freelance design for lots of different companies. Um, I did a bunch of design for, uh, a company down in uh, Texas that uh, that did the Tomb Raider game and Babylon Five card game. Wow! And then I did various different role playing jobs for people, and I got hooked up with uh, the Troll Lord Boys, yep. and I got hooked up with Goodman Games, and right now I'm working with uh, Fireside Creations down in Florida. Wow! Now is that in is in terms of business and finances, do you find it easier working as a freelance uh, designer for different companies than it was in the days that you were working for just a single company? You know, that's a, that's a very interesting question. With a freelance freelance person, I have found it's feast or famine. I get these great checks in, in like February and May and don't get anything at all in between. Oh, my, yeah. So I think I'd rather work on a salary than work... Uh, and work freelance, but that's just the way the work has played out. What about create? It's more stable. It's a more stable. Well, what? It's a more stable livelihood to be, to draw a salary, right? Uh, well, I don't know about the word stable. Actually, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I think that in the game design world, nothing is stable. What about in terms of creativity? Um, do you feel like you're able to be more creative in your designs when you're working for various companies than one? Well, the nice thing about that is uh, it, it helps fight off boredom. I get to I get to do lots of different projects for lots of different people. Mm -hmm. Usually, my work ethic these days is I work on a project all morning, and then in the afternoon I work on another project. Yeah, and you get up pretty early when you say morning. You're you're talking like four a.m. right? Well, sometimes lately I've been getting up at three, <laughs> but uh, usually I try to get up around six, and uh, and then work till noon take a nice long lunch, and then uh, work in the afternoon. Excellent, excellent. Um, let's uh, speak to some of that, too. The The thing you're working on currently is Dragon Scale Project, and you just recently have been working on, I think still are to some extent, the 77 Worlds Project, right? Well, yeah, 77 Worlds um, is an apocalypse role-playing game that I helped design with a, with a man called Stephen Lee. He, uh, he lives down in Florida, and he's the one that produces it. And we've we've jointly designed. The, uh, it's an apocalypse setting where uh, you start on the moon, and then you go to Earth, and then you go to Mars and Jupiter, and then you go out to seventy-seven different worlds. And right now, we're working on the Mars and Jupiter part of that. And uh, so, I've done adventures and other products for seventy-seven worlds, and then. Uh, while I was doing that, I said to him, hey, we really we really have to do a fantasy version. So that's what Dragon Scales became. And that's a big fantasy campaign with a great big city called Concord. And uh, I've got a couple adventures done in that. And I was just working on some short adventures this week. Right on. Okay. That's, will you be uh, doing any short stories or novels or anything like that connected with either one of these two? Uh, oh, so, you know, that's a great question, too. Uh, <laughs> Thank I've you. got, like, five different um, um, parts of anthologies that you can go on for 77 Worlds. Oh, cool. And you can get any of these on the firesidecreations.com website, 
And uh, the anthology is a lot of fun because I get to pull in writer friends that, I, that I've known for years, and we all write on an apocalyptic theme. Wow. That, that... I'm like, the one that's just going to come out uh, in the near future, I, took, I, I assumed that Disneyland would set up a great big, um, a great big fun palace on the moon. Yeah. So Disney characters keep coming out <laughs> and causing trouble. Wow, that's that's got that sense of uh, creepability to it too. It's a... yeah, exactly. That's what I wanted. And, and I, we just finished. I just finished writing a dragon scales um, short story that I'm quite proud of. So um, Stefan likes to do short story anthologies, and I agree with him. It really kind of helps get people interested in the product. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the things that made TSR famous in that we diversified into novels and short stories, and so. People who didn't play RPG games would read the books. Oh, absolutely! And become very interested in the world. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have encountered so many people when I was in high school who had read these novels, the Dragonlance yep. novels, the Forgotten Realms novels, and all of that. Um, who had never played, who didn't know anything at all about playing at all. I can remember finding that strange to meet people that had read those book series but had never touched the, the role-playing games. Yeah, yeah, and all of them were ripe for just finding someone to show them what was up with that, and, and then they would get involved in it. I, I've, I've at least started a couple of groups that way and then moved to some other place, so, yeah. Sure. That's exactly how it works, and, and that's, that's one of the fun parts about role-playing games. And you can read your favorite novel and, and enjoy that novel in a role-playing setting. And, and to some extent, isn't that what some of the first games were like, too? It was really a, almost like a, a medium through which someone who had read, say, a John Carter novel would be able to run an adventure and place his friends who had not read that same novel into that world and give them the experience of reading that novel without having read it and then thus turn them on to those novels? Well, funny you should bring that up. In 1974, when I met Gary Gygax, that's exactly how he lured me into his web. Uh, he told me that he had a game where I could play Conan and fight Set. <laughs> and I was hooked. I'll tell you, I was hooked. Yeah, no doubt. Sign, <laughs> sign me up for that. How's yeah. this work? I, am I going to get hurt? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's totally benign. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, so, now that, uh, I don't know, how much longer you're about ready to start a Kickstarter for Dragon Scales, or you just did, right? Dragon Scales, yes. Uh, you can check that out. Um, on Facebook, underneath Dragon Scales RPG, or you can check that out on the FiresideCreations.com website. Okay, we'll put those links uh, when we post this too, so that people That'd can access. That'd be great. Them. That'd be really good. Yeah, basically, it's uh, it's the it's the rules for the fantasy version for Dragon Scales. Um, in in those rules, I did something really different that I'm very proud of. You don't roll dice at all. You use a deck of cards. The Yes, the ward card generation method. I was reading about that. Yes. Please tell me more. I, I'm really proud of it in that you can tell people how to play in like 10 seconds because as you draw a red card, you're happy because it's helpful. And when you draw a black card, you're not happy because it hurts your, your situation. And, and the, the higher the value of the card, the more helpful or, or worse off you are. Is that right? Exactly right. Yeah, you 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 and, read through that. And, That's, yeah, absolutely. Set up and it worked really good. And you could use like a just a regular deck of cards, right? Yes, that's what you're supposed to use with the two jokers in it. What's the jokers represent? No, uh, the jokers represent maximum good or maximum bad. So that wow. you're you're at the gate of a city, and you the referee wants to find out um, how much the the gate guard likes you. So he draws a card and he draws a joker. And the gate guard considers you his brother. He, he sets up so that you take him wherever you need to go, and he makes sure that you're not bothered by anybody. Wow, that's Whereas funny. if you drew an ace of spades, he wouldn't even let you in the place. <laughs> Perhaps mistaken you for somebody who's actually wanted there, maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. That, that's, see, the, I, the deck system is really nice. It's it, I think it increases the role playing potential. Oh, yeah, oh, definitely! That's brilliant. I yeah. never even considered. I've never heard of this before. And it sounds like it allows you to um, really just add in these consequences right then and there, making it really fresh. Oh yeah, it's, it's yep. It's, it's definitely state state of the minute role playing. It's also interesting because the deck's communal. 
everybody uses the same deck, nope, I'm nope, assuming? Nope. Or everybody... No, no, no. Everybody has their own deck. Oh, yep. okay. Okay. Now, that's the nice part. Anytime you draw an ace or a joker, you reshuffle the discards into the deck. Ah, uh, I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah, so you get about, you, you'll get six shuffles, at least six, maybe more, depending on how many aces you draw, um, out of the deck to keep things fresh and, and interesting. And that really is up to the minute state of the art because there was a time when there was a huge issue trying to get a hold of like polyhydron solids, right? Oh, absolutely. Yep. In the early, well, in the late seventies to early eighties, um, there weren't a lot of places making them. Now everybody and their mother makes them. So it's yeah. Bad. <laughs> and specialized ones I, too, like I, with games. Yeah, I really like the deck system just for the role playing element. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And and I think there's a bit of a nostalgic element to it, too. There's a bit of being able to go back to some really basic uh, things like, you know, pencil, paper, and a deck of cards and, and be able to sit down with your family or your friends and, and tell a communal story in that fashion. That's something that people don't get together much anymore. They they get together over these kinds of mediums and over video game mediums and stuff. So it's always excellent when something comes around that allows people to take things that are, are right there around them in their house and set down and become a unit. Yeah, exactly right. And, and the nice thing about it is y- y- you understand it very quickly because, like, when you're in combat, you have to have a heart to hit really good and a diamond to have a glancing blow, and all the block cards are misses. So it's pretty easy to tell what happens. Wow, yeah. So quick, quick, quick uh, resolution, too, getting out of the way so you can tell a story. Yes, and you never toss a die on the floor. <laughs> no, no dies are no dies are lost in this process. No, no cats will interfere. <laughs> yes, exactly. Wow. So, is what do you got planned for um, beyond this point? What we're talking? Are you going to still be working with the same things that you're working on now? Are you planning on you know, staying there or di- diversifying out into other fields or? or other uh, companies or anything like that? No, you're just filled with interesting questions today. (laughs) Right now, I'm working with Chris Clark on a real big Troll Lord product where we're taking the old Starship Warden, the Metamorphosis Alpha game, and we're completely mapping 17 levels. It's never been done before in 45 years. Wow. That's going to be something. That's a huge project. It's going to be more than 400 pages. Wow. And then... Um, for Steven, we're doing uh, we're doing Mars for the 77 Worlds role playing game, and we're going to do a Tomb of Horrors for uh, for the Dragon Skill game. I really liked and enjoyed playtesting Gary's Tomb of Horrors, and I think it's still one of the classic um, role playing situations today. So I want a Dragon Scales version of that. Yeah, that sounds awesome. That really does. So before we let you go. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us? Any convention stories or anything like that? I know I got to um, play with you once, and it was certainly a joyous occasion to do so. I got killed about halfway through what you were doing, but it, it was definitely fun. Okay. Well, we are doing Gary Khan in March. That's in Lake Geneva. That's, that's put out by Luke Gygax and his family, mm-hmm. and it's to honor um, their father's memory, Gary Gygax. That convention is a great deal of fun for me because it attracts a lot of former TSR employees. So we have a nice little family reunion, a family reunion, a company reunion there. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of good conventions, but uh, I'm, I'm cutting down on my convention season. I, I had a, I had a situation where I lost my left foot to diabetes, and so I'm, I'm a little slow in moving around these days. Sure. I can yeah. understand that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely take care of yourself, man. Don't don't uh, stretch it or anything like that. Um, yeah, but I, I, keep, I keep really busy. I work every day, and I'm always looking for new projects to do. People are really nice. They, they give me a call on Facebook and uh, find out if I'm available for work. And, uh, and, and Stephen Lee has done a great job of keeping me super busy, and so does... Uh, so does Steve Chenault at Show Lords and uh, Joseph Goodman at Goodman Games. I really like working for those three companies. Yeah, they're they're pretty cool companies, at least from what I can see from the outside. Everything looks really well, nice. Well, and the Goodman Games people have really done a lot to support Metamorphosis Alpha. They've, they've got like 20 different products in the line, and, uh, and they're always doing more every year. So that's really nice for me. 
and then the Trollord boys, I've, I've done some very successful things for them. But the thing I'm most proud of is a book called The Storyteller's Thesaurus. Ah. And it's a thesaurus. It's a word book, but it's, it's got a different approach to it in that you, you look up a thing, and then it tells you about the thing. So you look up the word castle, and then it will give you a lot of different descriptions about castle parts. Or you look up the the uh, uh, historical treasures or legendary treasures or gods and goddesses, and all of those have um, pathways in the book that give you lots more detail about those things as opposed to just defining the word. Wow. Yeah. So that's good for novelists or any kind of storytellers? Yeah, or... absolutely. That I consider that my master work. Those are, that's from the Choler Boys. And that's still in... They sell that as a hardbound book or a PDF on their Trollard website. And for a while there, it was their best-selling product. So I'm really, I'm really pleased with that effort. Yeah, I can see that being useful to a wide variety of people you know, in different professions and such, too. The, you, yeah, it I, always amazes me on Facebook how, how teachers will, will um, email me on Facebook and tell me how they really enjoyed the book and how useful it was for their class. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that is cool, definitely. <laughs> it may, maybe you could... Uh, you know, just turn it into a textbook of some sort. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it does seem like, um, Jim, does it seem like that this, that this genre is, is, is uh, witnessing a renaissance here uh, 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 of late? Do you think it's kind of resurging? Well, you know, that, that's a very good question. I, yes, I do believe that uh, role-playing has picked up a pace, and I think that's because we're getting a lot of the computer gamers who love the com- fantasy right. computer games science fiction computer games, but they're looking for something new. Right. So they discovered this paper and pencil role playing. You know, we we old guys, we got in it the other way. We were paper players and we started playing computer games. Well the computer kids, as they get to be twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, are getting finding that computer game is a little stale. Um you, you, I think it just doesn't even compete with a, a regular game master who can respond back to the instant uh, actions of their players. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's one of Lots the... of those computer kids starting to play paper products. And then you hear a lot of those kids will say something like, yeah, you know, I got such and such game, and I, I beat it in six days. Yes. <laughs> it's like, that you know. That doesn't happen to D&D. <laughs> yeah. But there's just a problem in AD&D and in, in any role-playing game right. that you rise the levels too fast. Yeah. In TSR, we always worried about the kids who would go from first level to tenth level on their weekend? That's, yeah, <laughs> it's something that kind of bother us no end. Something, Jim, you said that you know um, uh, something that kind of passed through my head earlier when you were talking about using the playing cards, you know, the decks of playing cards and stuff. And and one of the things with computer games is it's every one of them in this genre is pretty much identical. When you really get down to it, it's skills, it's armor class, it's you know so. And, and, and it, I, I, so when you had talked about that, I'd never heard about using the playing cards before. I was like, well, look at there. There's an innovation that's, that's, that's happening in the pen and paper game or side of the thing, whereas in the computer, it really still hasn't. It's so stale. It just has not innovated at all, and I don't know that it can. Like, that's going to be its yeah. limitation, and maybe that's... One nice thing about the computer game, of course, is you can sit in your room and play it by yourself. Right. Well, yeah, that, that is handy. But again, I think I think if they get a little older, they're looking for other stuff to do. Yeah, something deeper, something that they can scratch that intellectual part of their brain a little bit more. With and you. you know, the nice part too, of course, um, at TSR when we were working there, I worked at TSR for twenty years, and uh, we were always looking to bring in more females. The hobby started out with ninety nine percent males, right? But when we introduced Dragonlance to the kids. And the Dragonlance storyline, um, that had major female characters in it. Yeah. And that attracted a good number of, of girls into the into the hobby. And we still have that working for us now in that um, the hobby has it's a much better evenly matched percentage of, of guys and girls. And it's just nothing like having a basement filled with your friends, including a couple attractive girls. Right. Yeah. To make your gaming really fun. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't hurt. Yeah, I I've had um, girls play in my campaigns a lot actually, and I don't know if that's because I was married at the time, you know, and it was more accessible if somebody else was already there. But they really engage in the story 
a lot deeper sometimes than my guy friends do. And they... Absolutely, you are correct. And I think the female player is, is definitely a wildly different player than the male yep. player. The male player is more like charge in, beat the monster, find the treasure. Yep. Where the female player is more like let's check around and maybe take this area over for our own. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. More, more cunning. Yes, very definitely more cunning. <laughs> they embellish the story, too. They They give a good reason for having, you know, story plots going on they emphasize that i think yeah the richard yes, experience absolutely you know that's that's what dragonlance did and we were very pleased with the result and now fantasy is something that you see everywhere isn't it well it is it's 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 75 percent of the market really the science fiction there's really big and a little horror and a little little uh uh boot hill western type but basically fantasy is the king right now yeah yeah it used to be kind of on the fringe back way, way back. It used to be on the fringe. You had to have certain types of magazines and certain types of pulp novels to be able to, to have that. But, but now, you know, you see it everywhere. I mean, I'm, I'm, I think that's excellent though. Yeah, it's, it's good. It's like a pendulum shift, you know, in, in, uh, in the early fifties and late fifties, it was Westerns on TV, um, gun smoke and Paladin and those kind of things. But that pendulum is kind of swift shifted over to uh police videos like CSI and, and NCIS. But I think it just it changes with time. People get tired of one genre and they pick up another. And that's that's definitely what's happening with with uh with the hobby industry. Fantasy is still king, but I think it's it's shifting over to other other different storylines. Well that's how it happened to begin with too, right? It started with sort of the fantasy genre and then that spawned the science fiction genre, did it not? Like it, it, that's it came out of, um, out of the original, uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, was where it started, and then the, then the science that's, fiction. That's very genre true. Came. When I when I was playing with Gary, I told him he had to have a science fiction version. So then we did Metamorphosis Alpha, which was the first, um, right science fiction role playing game, and we also did Gamble World, which is the first apocalyptic role playing game. And but and, what would happen with with uh, competitors to TSR? is they would do things that TSR wasn't doing. So we have Traveler from GDW. We have Battletech, um, which is big robots fighting. Um, we did, or they did lots of different genres that we weren't working in at all. Yeah, there's a lot and that, of them. And that did well for them. And then there was that whole genre where, um, like, I, I played the Star, War, the Star Wars role-playing game. Like then, then, like, movies started spawning role-playing games out of them, too, right? There was that whole... Very true, yep. Very true. So, and that's just a phase, and and you know what? Probably one to your point that's just going to repeat again eventually. Because because with the fantasy resurgence that's happening now, then basically the science fiction and the dystopian stuff and all that's going to be right behind it, and then it, it just gonna it's just gonna re ebb and flow like it always has. Yeah, I, I, there's there's a lot of this that makes me think back to Joseph Campbell and his Hero of a Thousand Masks book, you know, there's always a need to update the mythology of, of your culture. That makes yeah, sense. I agree. And, and uh, you know, role-playing games and are an excellent way to do that. It's an excellent way to continue to update movies, role-playing games, things like that, to keep that mythology relevant to the times and stuff, to swing back and forth between what's going on currently and that mythology. Jim, uh, and what else it does is it's nice in that it spawns other markets. You know, the novels and the game books. That, remember the pick a pass books? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I so did thousands and thousands of those. Um, and and so it's, it's nice in that you can expand into other areas. Yeah, that's true. And there's a lot of new mediums um, opening up, too. I was talking with Peter Atkinson about uh, doing an interview with him next year. He's working on a project. And it's a web-based project, and, you know, that's, that's like a, a new medium now. There's a lot of things coming out on the web that are just web-based products and stuff like that. And so new mediums to venture out into, and people are, especially, you know, the very creative people are. Yep. There's, yeah, that's definitely on my bucket list. I would really like to do a big uh, web-based game with, that has hundreds of people playing it all the time. Wow, that would be cool. It's just, it's it's so I was going to ask you this, Jim. So, it, it, but it seems like social media, the internet, uh, web-enabled technology, all of this is really kind of an, a whole new level for which this these kinds of platforms can sit a, 
sit on top of now, though, right? It, it's kind of redefine technology, sort of changing it, but not necessarily all in a bad way. No, that's true, though. Like especially Skype, we've uh, we played several different role playing games on Skype with five or six people in different parts of the country. Yeah, so and that uh, that kind of thing is becoming more and more prevalent. Yeah, they've got the um, what is it, the Roll Twenty uh, site too, which is like a intermediary for people to get on and run games, right? Specifically, sure, absolutely. I've not I've not used that myself. I have ran some games uh, with Skype, and they've been they've worked out really well. I, I uh, did with a guy who lived in the United Arab Emirates, and then he moved back to his homeland in Denmark uh, during that campaign and character generation process, and it worked out really well. We had a lot of fun. We talked about uh, maybe getting other people involved in it, too. But then I ended up getting deep into school where I'm at now and stuff. And Life takes over, as it yeah. does. But, yeah, the, the, the Internet and, and things like that, I never even considered that right. But, sure, Skype makes a lot of sense. You keep the old group back together, um, you know, because everybody's, you know, you, you get your group of friends, and then everybody goes off, goes to college, gets married, and then everyone's life starts settling down. And then, boom, Skype, hey, let's get the game going again. I never even thought about that as a methodology, but that maybe that's part of it too, is this the ability for people to connect this. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice. You know, people have lots of free time these days, you know, especially those college kids with nothing to do. <laughs> this is, yep. <laughs> guilty, huh? So, so yeah, it's just handy, handy way to play the game. Definitely. Yeah, it's brilliant. And, and so in, in a sense the 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 world of warcrafts and stuff that sort of um I, I i don't think that those are as prevalent now there's so many of them and like i said they're stale they're just all the same and and with the resurgence of uh a pen and paper games because they can just be whatever you want them to be it's, it makes sense people are starting to commune together and instead of sitting around the card table rolling dice though there's other mediums through which they can kind of connect and uh bring this thing back to life Sure. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And, and pro- you know, the problem with World of Warcraft and, and Lord of the Rings is that you're not doing any design work. Right. You know, you're just responding to the computer. And that yeah. can get old fast. It gets hollow after a while, whereas campaigns, pen and paper campaigns, become extremely personal to people. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. I mean, I've, uh, we talked about this on a prior podcast, but, you know, witnessing people having literal, um, almost, you know, losing a character is, is a big deal to them. They get really attached to these characters. Well, that's a good and a bad thing, isn't it? Yeah, I guess so. Right. <laughs> I mean, sure. Yeah. And, and I've I, been at conventions, I've been at conventions where, you know, the 12 year old girl started crying because her character died. Oh. I really felt bad. Oh my. <laughs> what can you do? Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Welcome to the big leagues, right? <laughs> I know. I can't. I can't tell them. Oh, your character didn't die. Stop crying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although I think they would have forgave you if you had. <laughs> no, well, I, I give them, when I when I play at conventions, especially, I give them a warning that that I design very competitive, very difficult scenarios, and if you survive till the very end. You've done a great job and should feel proud. Yeah, I yeah, I absolutely have to agree. Given that I had experienced that very thing, and I, I thought I was doing well and made it as far as I did, I still tell my players, "Hey, man, I made it halfway through." <laughs> 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 so <laughs> that's your example for Maybe killing. Maybe we get it kind this year. We can change that to all the way through. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to get back to uh, Gary Con. I went to like the first four or five and. Uh, then started going to school, man, and I've been hitting school just so hard, going through summer classes and everything, and I'm getting within just a few semesters of being done, so I definitely intend on going back to Gary Con again. I miss it. Oh, very good. What's your degree going to be in? Um, I'm going to get a history degree. I'll, when I graduate, about two, three semesters at most, I'll have a bachelor's degree in history and an associate's degree in philosophy. Oh, that's terrific. I have a a history and English degree from from Whitewater University. Cool, man. I knew that. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's that's. I love it. I love it. It's like just what I love the most. I love going to school. I, I work out there. It's at Ohio University Lancaster branch, and I work at the library and stuff. And it's probably the best thing I've ever done with my life. And I fully intend on going to graduate school if I can. That's great. 
Yeah, I loved it too, except the South American history. I couldn't keep those names in my head. Oh, man, I found Sumerian history to be really hard. <laughs> like it was, it's like there's the Sumerian, Babylonian, Assyrian history, the Mesopotamian area. Man, those names. Sure, I wrote Ooh. on that stuff for my deities and demigods and for the Troll Lords book of Gods and Monsters. I wrote about those boys. Yes, you did. And I brought those in and showed them to my professor, in fact. Oh, did you really? <laughs> I did. <laughs> I said, yeah. because we were talking about the uh, Scroll of the Dead and talking about how Anubis would lead you um, through the scribe period, and then you had to weigh your um, heart against the feather of truth on yeah. the scales, and we were talking about all of that, and I said, here's this excellent picture, and look, there's these deities and stuff, and showed him some maps I was drawing that were to scale of the Galilean area and stuff for my campaign and stuff, and he, he was amazed. He's amazed, and to this day, I, I bring him in things and show him stuff like that. <laughs> oh, neat. That's cool. He loves it. He loves it when, when, just like we were talking, he loves it when things like this spawn and generate other creativity to interact with it, you know? Yeah, sure. Well, I get, I get letters every month about kids and, and adults who say that deities and demigods and of gods and monsters really spurred them to study history. So I think that's great. That's what role-playing was supposed to do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's it, another medium for learning at the end of the day, yeah. right? Exactly. You know, you want to do better in your game, and you can do better by studying up a little bit on history, you know? Oh, I'll find yeah. out about light crossbows and heavy crossbows or, or, or long bows and their limitations. Yeah, yeah. And it felt like cheating so many times, like especially with uh, the Egyptian class, the ancient Egyptian class that I took. You know, I felt like I was preparing for a campaign. <laughs> you, had, <laughs> you had the notes there for you, didn't you? It, yeah, yeah. It was great. I mean, I loved it. And it was all laid out. It was like a source book, and I incorporated all those things into it, and everything was awesome. <laughs> well, I worked very hard at, at turning the actual history into game things so that, you know, we, we find out that Odin had a spear he was very proud of, so I made sure the spear was named and its reported powers were in. Same thing with his horse, Slepner. You know, that, that it was a six-legged beast and what it could do. Yeah. So, and that was, for both of those books, I've written lots of, actually, um, mythologies now, gaming mythologies. I try to incorporate the real history into the into the storyline. And there's so much in history that that it's so rich with adventure and weird things that happened, and so many legends still that could be yeah, adventure you don't, products. You don't need to make it up. Yeah, it's like already all there, right? Well, sometimes you have to pull it back too. Those those Aztecs were really grisly people. <laughs> yeah, sure for public consumption for sure, definitely. <laughs> no, pun, yeah. no pun intended, just, right? <laughs> no. I have this thing when I design products. I call it the angry mother rule. No. Oh. I make sure that anything I design, if the mother is reading over the son's shoulder at the product, she won't get angry at what she reads. Man, that is super wise. I did my historical thesis for my bachelor degree. I've already got that done. And I did it on the Satanic Panic in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, and oh, uh, sure. I, I I got a really good grade on it and everything. And but you know when I was researching it and stuff, part of which I lived through. But when I was researching it and stuff, you know you really do have to be careful because this panic is something that goes from one to another. It started off as a cult panic, went into a Satanic Panic, and then came the Super Predator Panic, and then moved on from there. It's it's oh man, it was it was. Terrible at TSR when, when that bad. stuff first came out, but I had a brilliant idea. I really pat myself on the back because these people who were going crazy about Satanism and D and D, they never read any of our products. <laughs> so they don't we even read their own the name products. of devils and demons to something entirely different, and and then we claim, hey, we have no demons and devils in our books, and that like settled them down completely. Yeah, it ended. <laughs> Our end of the, our books are bad because they're filled with demons and devils. This was literally just on um, the, what's that show called? The Young Sheldon. Uh, his mom finds his Dungeons and Dragons book. And like, I, I was telling, because I knew Eric, 
uh, we did a podcast on this actually, and, and I said, "Oh, you got to see this because they're talking about what you wrote your paper on." <laughs> but I don't watch TV and don't have one. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, there's that. But um, but uh, it, it, it's still present in that it's remembered in that cultural because the, the show takes place in the '70s, late '70s, early yeah. '80s. So there it is. It's it was it's indelible. It's it's, it's it is part, part of the, history. Yeah, it's part of the pop culture, I guess, yeah. from that era. So much so that they had to put it in the television show. It's, it was the oh, plot. It was terrible. T- Times and it cost cost his star millions of dollars. I'll bet. Yeah, we get... had solid Sears and Penny's sales of the books, and five mothers wrote to Sears, just five, oh. and complained about having devils in it. And Sears dropped us. Wow! So he that... went from a three million dollar account to a zero account in one year. Jeez, that power still exists today with uh, recording artists that do music. If you, if you have uh, explicit that explicit lyric sticker on your album. You forget Walmart, you know. Now I kind of I understand that, but it's like it's amazing how powerful those special interest type groups can be. Yeah, uh, to these major corporations. Well, I mean, even back then they were finding backmasking and everything too. I mean, it's it it will evolve and still hit all the same mediums for sure. Sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, I I you know, and the thing about changing the names, Jim, is that. There was two parts to my thesis, and one part of it was that because there was that historical connection with AD&D, it allowed the right-wing church uh, religious section of, of culture to legitimize their own position because they could legitimize the evils of D&D. At the same time, it legitimized the goodness of their position. Once those mm-hmm. names were changed and that trail was broken, that link was broken, and you were saying as a company, no, no, these are not real demons. You can't summon them. They're these other things from the other planes of existence or whatever. Then you yeah. took that power away from yep. them. There's, they can't venerate or, you know, what's the what's the opposite of venerate? Like uh, D&D, they can't demonize it. demonize D&D. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Because it, it, they folded like accordion. That it, was really yeah, yeah, you stole their thunder. Yeah, you literally took stole their thunder with that. Yeah, it's amazing gen- how how powerful semantics are, though. Isn't that ridiculous? And it's kind of neat that you picked up on that, um, and 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 knew it was just a semantic thing with them. And if you change the semantics, it would they'd probably be okay with it, which they were, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, our we started out saying all you have to do is read our stuff to tell that we're were were not evil or bad, but they would never read the stuff. See, that's and so I. I I said, well, okay, if they won't read our stuff, you know, that's that's shame on them. This is what we could do to <laughs> fool them completely. Sure. And, and, we... and that was the real magecraft of Dromage. That's funny. Oh. So predictable, <laughs> though, huh? Yes, yes, so predictable. <laughs> <laughs> and that, uh, that was one of your characters, right, Dromage? Dromage, yes. He was a wizard that... I. I kept making spells in Gary's game of stuff I really wanted to do. And in Gary's game, if you spent a lot of, uh, if you spent a lot of game time and cash, you could make up pretty much any spell you wanted to make. Hmm. And so I had five or six of them there and he started calling them dronage spells. My name backwards. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary loved doing people's names backwards on his uh, big campaign world maps. Uh, Almost all of his friends, our names of countries backwards. Yeah, like uh, Parenland, for instance, right? Yeah, exactly. Parenland and um, Alicia and uh, the uh, county of Ulick, which is for Luke, right? Yep. And there's yep. a duchy of Ernst. And yeah. Of, and, of course, you know, Dromage is one of the main wizards of that area. And yeah. Have you got Luke on your... Uh on your podcast yet um i ask him and he hasn't had a chance to get back with me presumably because he's like uh nose deep up in gary con things going on sure you should hit him up for the first weekend in march though because that's you know that week is is gary con itself and they'd be good advertising for him right on i will definitely do that i'll get back with him if, if uh, he doesn't get back with me i'll ping him again see if he'll see if he's got time or anything definitely definitely well, sir. Well, anything else that you'd like from me? No, sir. Uh, thank you very much for the time that you've given us. It's been excellent talking to you, and I really appreciate it. And an honor. Thank you, sir. Oh, I appreciate that, too. So The only thing I disagreed about in your uh, 
introduction was the word legendary. <laughs> <laughs> and all the legends never see themselves that way, right? I mean, that's just so. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Well, sir, I, I really appreciate having you on the show. Thank you for taking the time. And uh, if anything changes, you got anything new that's coming out you want to get on and talk about and uh, talk to the guests about, we'd be, we would love to have you back on the show. Um, so uh, putting that aside, I guess that's it for tonight. Thanks for everybody listening, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Okay. Okay.